The temporal and infratemporal fossa. The infratemporal fossa has the following borders and contents. Um, the yellow arrow shows where the temporal fossa is, and it's called the infratemporal fossa because we move in an inferior direction and go below that zygomatic arch and deep to the ramus of the mandible. That's when we're inside that infratemporal fossa. We now take a look at an inferior view of the skull, and we're now in this infratemporal fossa, and that uh, dotted green area is showing the borders. And what are the borders of the infratemporal fossa? Well, first, this is the area that's deep to the zygomatic arch, posterior to the maxilla, anterior to the mastoid process of the temporal bone, and lateral to the pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. There we have the borders of the infratemporal fossa. Now, what are the contents of the infratemporal fossa? Uh, they include the following. There is the foramen ovale that transmits the uh, mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, VN3, and there is the uh, mandibular nerve entering the infratemporal fossa. So if you remember this picture from previous tutorials, there is where uh, the foramen ovale is located, and that's where V3 gets into the infratemporal fossa. Next is the foramen spinosum that transmits the middle meningeal artery. Well, there's the foramen spinosum in that middle meningeal artery. And so remember this picture? There's the middle meningeal artery as it supplies the dura mater. And that is how the middle meningeal artery gets from the infratemporal fossa to the scalp, or to the dura mater, pardon me. Next is the infraorbital fissure that transmits cranial nerve V2, the maxillary nerve. And there we've got that infraorbital fissure. <clears throat> Here we've got in green showing the uh, V2, and that's the uh, infraorbital fissure where the V2 is going to transmit to go from infratemporal fossa to the maxillary region. Next is some uh, uh, opening called the petrotympanic fissure. That's what transmits the chorda tympani nerve, as evidenced there. It's just medial and posterior to the mandibular fossa. So remember this picture that shows um, the uh, in blue that chorda tympani nerve as it joins the lingual nerve. Well, that's how the chorda tympani nerve gets into the infratemporal fossa to bind to the lingual nerve. And finally, the mandibular fossa is this uh, concave surface that serves as an articulation for the temporal mandibular joint, and there we have it. So. Those were the borders and contents. Now let's do some other things for the infratemporal fossa. For example, let's talk about the temporomandibular joint. So the temporomandibular joint, also known as the TMJ, has the following components. There's the mandibular fossa, remember in green arrow there. Then there's an articular disc, and this articular disc is fibrocartilage that resides between the mandibular fossa and the mandibular condyle. Um, that's going to articulate with the mandibular fossa to make a synovial uh, bicondylar or hinge joint. Then the joint capsule uh, is, a, is the uh, extension of the periosteum from the mandibular condyle that wraps around and goes to the mandibular fossa. So there we have the components of the temporal mandibular joint. Um, let's talk now about the muscles of mastication that act on the temporal mandibular joint. So first is our masseter muscle that arises from the zygomatic arch and then courses down to attach to the ramus of the mandible and it's what is the action of this muscle is to elevate the mandible with power at the TMJ and it's innervated by cranial nerve V-3 um, the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. Next is our temporalis muscle that arises from the temporal fossa and courses down to attach to the um, coronoid process of the mandible, and notice it goes deep to the zygomatic arch. The uh, action of this muscle is also to elevate the mandible with power, as in mastication, chewing, and in this muscle is also innervated by cranial V3. Now the medial pterygoid muscle is a muscle that attaches, uh, it's deep to the ramus of the mandible, and it courses uh, from the ramus of the mandible to the pterygoid plate. And the action of this muscle is side-to-side uh, -side movement of the mandible is in chewing, and this muscle is also innervated by cranial nerve V-3. The lateral pterygoid muscle arises from the uh, um, coronoid, uh, the condyloid process of the mandible and courses to the pterygoid plate, and this muscle is going to help 
depress the mandible and move the mandible, protract the mandible forward. And the lateral pterygoid is innervated by cranial nerve V3, the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So here we have the temporal mandibular joint again. Now the condylar head of the mandible is seated in the mandibular fossa. The articular disc is situated between the condyle and the fossa. So there's a mandibular fossa, there's the articular disc which is between the mandibular fossa and that mandibular condyle. And there we have the lateral pterygoid muscle. So when the lateral pterygoid muscle contracts, it pulls the mandibular condyle and articular discs inferiorly and anteriorly. And this is how we can get the jaw to open up so wide. So the contraction of the lateral pterygoid muscle pulls both the condylar head and articular discs anterior and inferiorly to depress the mandible in this fashion. All right, now the muscles of mastication. What branchial arch does the mandible, mandible and associated muscle derive from? It's derived from the first branchial arch, that Meckel's cartilage in the mandible, and then all these muscles that form around it, uh, muscles of mastication, and so forth. So therefore, the common innervation is the first branchial arch that gives rise to muscles of mastication is the trigeminal nerve, specifically cranial nerve V-3. All right, also in the infratemporal fossa are now nerves. So nerves of the infratemporal fossa. So we have the inferior nerve and the mental nerve and the lingual nerve. Let's focus on the first two. There we have the foramen ovale that transmits the mandibular uh, nerve, cranial nerve V3, into the infratemporal fossa and gives rise to the inferior alveolar nerve branch of V3, which goes to the t uh, mandibular teeth and then exits via this mental foramen to give rise to innervating the skin of the chin and lower lip. In this picture, there's the inferior al alveolar nerve, but it's been cut. We can see that mental nerve exiting the mental foramen. And then there's our lingual nerve as well. And that lingual nerve in yellow, uh, there's yellow, is going to bring general sensation from the front of the tongue, but it also has contributions from cranial nerve 7. And so there in green, I'm going to do that a couple of times. You see in green right there, there is our corded tympani nerve. It's a branch from cranial nerve 7. Uh, here we now have cranial nerve 7, specifically talking about the corded tympani branch. So there's the corded tympani nerve, and in green there it is, as it enters the infratemporal fossa via that petrotympanic fissure. And once inside the infratemporal fossa, the corded tympani nerve, which is going to innervate our sublingual and submandibular salivary glands, as well as bring special sensation from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, or taste. And so how is that nerve going to get to, um, how is the corded tympani going to get to its structure? Well, here we've got cranial nerve V-3. So the corded tympani nerve is going to hitchhike on cranial nerve V-3 to get from the tongue and from the salivary glands um, in that infratemporal fossa. So here we have it again. There's our lingual nerve from V3 and there's the corded tympanic branch from 7 in the infratemporal fossa.